The innocence of children, isn't it wonderful and sweet? Thank you, children. I know your Uncle Stephen would have been delighted to hear you sing. Our text for today is Ephesians chapter 2. This also was one of the portions of scripture that Stephen and I read on many occasions together and shared some of the great and wonderful truths that the Word of God sets forth for us in that portion of text. Today I am burying a very good friend. Unlike some of the funerals which I've had to do, which I did not very well know the individual, I knew and loved Stephen very much. He is also my brother. And someday we will see one another again, because we're both members of the same family of God. He suffered greatly, but I rejoice with him that now he sings with the eternal heavenly chorus in praise to our gracious God and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's word for his people, beginning in verse 4 of Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This passage from the Word of God, one of Stephen's favorite passages, Oh, how we love to discuss the great, the great truths that are herein contained. This passage tells us that there can be no Christmas in heaven unless we are saved by grace. All of the tinsels and the toys and the trivia and the treats and the trash that's left over from the Christmas of the world means nothing if Christmas is over at death. This was one of the passages that Steve and I read together and discussed at great length while he was in the hospital. The truths of this passage came out in our fellowship almost every time over the many times that we visited together during his extended suffering. And I believe this is a passage that he would want me to share with you today. So how does Christmas in heaven fit into this magnificent doctrinal passage that Stephen loved so well? Well, let's start by having a bird's eye view sort of as of the passage, as, as though we were in heaven with Stephen, looking down at this passage, looking down at our circumstances here of life. We're a week out from Christmas. Stephen sitting there with a great cloud of witnesses looking down toward earth as each one of us continues to run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Stephen had his cross. He endured it patiently. He endured it with faith. 
And now as he with that great cloud of witnesses views us down here below, how will we run our race? Will we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross? Two verses in this passage that we've just read tell us that we are saved by grace. In verse 5, by grace ye are saved. In verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. For the Christian, these are some of the most beautiful words in our language. These words tell us that we are in grave danger and we need to be rescued. These words describe our natural condition that we are desperately lost. These words reveal that there is a way of escape from that natural condition of sin and death. These words certify that God will show us the door through which the escape is possible. And you've heard it read in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. These words guarantee that there is not only a door, but there is an all-sufficient means whereby our escape is made possible. These words tell us that there are some awesome forces at work. Look briefly at that word saved. That's the one that tells us we're in danger of eternal death. Just over a year ago, I'm sure you remember the incident, there were a group of Chilean copper miners who were trapped 1,700 feet underground. The whole world was watching as other miners drilled three shafts down to where the, these miners were trapped nearly a half mile below the ground. People were praying all over the world. This congregation was praying for those men who were trapped. Through the first small shaft were dropped oxygen lines and food and water. And then the larger shafts began to be drilled until finally there was a shaft that was large enough for a capsule that had been made to drop all the way down and that capsule could open underground and one man could stand inside and the door would close and they would pull him up by a cable 1,700 feet until he reached the surface. These men were in grave danger. There was no means of escape. Someone from above had to reach down and rescue them at great cost, at great expense, at great energy, while others watched to see the results. What is not as well widely known is that in those containers that went down to the men were Bibles in their own language. What also went down in those containers, as it looked like the time was coming to send the main container down to bring them to the surface, were bright t-shirts, and on those t-shirts were written the words, Thank you, Lord. And as each of those miners stepped forth, they were wearing those t-shirts. Although God used human instruments, it was the God of heaven to whom they gave their thanks for their rescue. Saved. What a marvelous word that is. The other word, grace. Oh, that tells us something about our salvation. It tells us that we don't deserve to escape. Suppose those men had been men on death row and placed at the bottom of that pit. They did not deserve to escape. And yet the word grace tells us that God reaches down into the morass of this world and his salvation is not because we deserve it. Verse 8. His salvation is because of his grace, his unmerited favor. 
We have a God who is good. This world has been marred by sin and all that we see around us, tainted by sin, has come to us as a result of sin. And so there is this thing we call death. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. But the grace of God, we did not deserve it, reached down into this world, and God provided not only a means of escape, but it is an all-sufficient means of escape through Christ. Saved, that tells us that there is someone who is strong enough to save us. Oh, we would love to save others, but we are not ourselves strong enough. But saved means there is someone strong enough. And then grace tells us that that someone is willing, not only strong enough, for you can be strong enough, but you may not be willing. There is someone who is willing to save us, to give us a benefit that we do not deserve. Saved. That tells us that we're hopeless and incapable of delivering ourselves. Oh, how many people think that somehow they are going to deliver themselves. But saved tells us we could not deliver ourselves. For if we could deliver ourselves, Christ would not have had to die. And then grace tells us that there is someone who sees our helpless condition and has chosen to have mercy and to love us. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. What marvelous combination of words. Saved and grace also tells us that there is a battle raging for the souls of men because of sin. And dear friends, that's where it ties to Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. At Christmas, God personally entered the war through the incarnation to redeem us, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and Satan and open the way for an eternal heavenly home, which is where Stephen is today. The children sang about it. They told you about the little house. They told you all about the exciting things that there are as children looking forward to in this marvelous place. Oh, heaven, what a glorious shore that will be for each of us. Sin makes us dead, not sick. That's what it tells us in verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. That is, he's made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Without outside power, dead men cannot live again. Dead men cannot respond to the realm of living. Remember that when you consider the grace that God has extended to you, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. There may be someone here today who is thinking that, oh, they'll make it to heaven because they've been good. Not by works of righteousness what we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Saved in grace tells us that there is more to life than physical life and pleasures. Did you see in that passage how many incredible words are joined with saved and grace? There's God, there's rich mercy, there's great love, there's dead in sins, quickened with Christ, raised up, sitting together, heavenly places, Christ Jesus, ages to come, exceeding riches of his grace, his kindness toward us, through Jesus Christ. Oh, what a glorious thought as we think of the physical resurrection. And that is what is emphasized, and rightly so, when we approach a funeral. We will rise from the dead. But did you notice something else in this passage here? It's true the believers have been made and are destined for heavenly places. It says so right here. Made us to sit together with him in heavenly places. 
But did you realize that that verse not only describes our position in Christ, but it also describes our ultimate destination. The heavenly places in Him. Yes, that is our position, but it is also our destination in verse 6. This is not only Stephen's position in Christ in some spiritual sense, but these heavenly places are where Stephen is today. And that's why this will be his best Christmas ever. The angels sang at the birth of our Savior. The angels rejoiced, as Scripture tells us, when Stephen trusted Christ. The angels watched in wonder as Stephen patiently suffered with steadfast faith through the painful trials of his physical agony. The angels observed as Jesus built that mansion for Stephen, as Jesus described it himself in John 14. The angels rejoiced when Jesus took Stephen by the hand this past Monday. He reached out his hand and said, Come home, son. I've prepared a place for you. It's finished. It's ready. And it's waiting. And Stephen reached up and took the Lord's hand and with a smile stepped through the doors of eternity. The angels marveled as Jesus led Stephen into the throne room and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That's what it says in our text. How Stephen rejoiced in this passage. How Stephen loved these great and precious promises. As the billions and billions of angelic choristers sing their Christmas praise to the Savior, Stephen will be there with Jesus and with his dear mother Jean and with the saints of all the ages joining in chorus, praising the Lamb that was slain, singing the glory of the one who redeemed us with his blood. Worthy is the Lamb. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us how we are to respond. In Ecclesiastes 7 we read, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. Truly this is Stephen's best Christmas ever, because it's Christmas in heaven. But more than that, Stephen has also given us a very valuable Christmas gift. Did you know he left you a gift as he departed? In God's divine wisdom in taking Stephen at this time, Stephen, according to this text in Ecclesiastes, has bestowed on us the opportunity for spiritual growth for those who will receive it. Stephen has left us the fragrance of a good name, the example of his godly, Christ-centered life better than precious ointment. His home going also bestows on us the gift of sober contemplation of life and death so that we might number our days and apply our hearts to wisdom. That's in that phrase, so that the living will lay it to his heart. We are the living whom Stephen has left behind. When you go from this place, will you have grown in wisdom? We 
have grown in your purpose to serve Christ? Will Stephen's good name and the testimony that he set have made a difference in your life? Saved. Grace. Those are those marvelous words that extend forever. That in the ages to come, he, that is Jesus, might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. The ages to come. The ages to come. God continues to show his kindness, his exceeding riches of his grace toward us. Stephen has entered into that fullness of joy there. That kindness, the riches of the grace of Almighty God Himself. Saved in grace, those are the words that cement for us the meaning of the incarnation which we celebrate at this season. The Christmas story in our minds written in indelible ink. Christmas in heaven, the gracious reminder that those who are saved enjoy God's grace and His kindness forever. But how is that marvelous work of God applied to our hearts? And verse 8 tells us it's by faith, and there is no other way. But what is faith? Where does it come from? What does God use to create faith in our hearts? He uses the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Dear friends, today you are hearing the word of God. And he himself, God himself, is offering you a gift. It is not by your works. It is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. One other category that we must mention here, and Stephen was greatly concerned about this, for certain family members, for certain of his friends, Perhaps they are there here today. Family members and friends who were saved, but who are not living for Christ. Oh, how we wept together. How we wept together for those who know the Savior, and yet who are walking in their own ways. If Stephen could speak to you this morning, he would call out and cry to you to turn back to living for Christ. Oh, this dear brother loved you so much. He loved you so much. And how we prayed for you together. You know, God takes you as you are. It doesn't matter how you come to him in your depravity and sin. He takes you as you are when you trust Christ. But he never leaves you as you are. As the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and begins to work in your heart, he is conforming you to the image of his Son. Poema, workmanship, is the word that Paul uses here in verse 10. God's design for you is to produce in you works that reflect your faith, the good works. And God expects you, through the power of his Spirit, to continue in them, to walk, not in the lusts of the flesh, but in the power of the Spirit of God. Today we're gathered together in the presence of these mortal remains of our dear brother and friend. But the body in this casket is not the real Stephen DeVoe, it's merely the house that he lived in while he was with us. He's moved out of his house. He's gone to live in that magnificent mansion in heaven. He can hear the Christmas angels sing. Let not your heart be troubled, because Jesus has prepared a place for Stephen. If he were preaching this message, he would tell you, the focus of your faith must be on Christ. That focus must be there for salvation. That focus must be there for spiritual growth. That focus must be there for daily living. That focus must be there in the painful and lonely times that will follow for many of us in the days that lie ahead 
as we feel the absence of Stephen's presence. Where do you stand today in your relationship to Christ? If Stephen could speak to us, he would comfort those who are filled with sorrow. He would remind us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He would tell us of the glories of heaven. He would tell us what truly glorious music is like. But mostly he would tell us of the glories of the Savior. And then he would remind us that someday we must stand before the Lord Jesus to give an account. Are you ready? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We wear our veneers, we wear our facades, but you penetrate by your word into our hearts. Again, we pray, Father, that you would take your word, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Again, Father, we pray for each of the beloved family members and friends who are present here. Give them courage. Give them strength. Give them comfort. Give them the peace that passes all understanding. For your word has declared that Stephen, having placed his faith in Jesus Christ, is in heavenly places even as we speak. And your word is true. And so, Father, we thank you for Stephen's life. We thank you that even in death he bears testimony to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, how we thank you that the goodness and grace of Christ extends to us while we are yet sinners. Christ died for us. And so, Father, we pray that you will cause us as we go from this place to remember not only Stephen, but the Savior whom he loved and the word which he studied every day with great joy and gladness. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that Stephen loved to do, oh, many family gatherings, and they'll tell you this, he loved to sing the doxology. And so we're going to stand and we're going to sing together, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We'll sing the doxology because that is what Stephen would have wanted at the end of this service. Let's stand to sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 